Hi, I'm Jeffrey, and this is Auto Alchemy, the intersection between typology and self growth. And today I'm going to be typing Mr. Rogers. This video is basically a continuation of my Objective Personality Explained series, and with this series, I'm trying to fill some voids that I see in the Objective Personality community. So I've been using the system for a couple of years now. I am quite fond of it, and I feel like I'm really getting a foothold on, first of all, using the tools from the system to type people effectively, and I'm also getting a handle on how to explain it in what I hope is a clear and logical way. So that's a vacuum that I'm hoping that I can fill with videos like this one. So that was my reason for doing the series, but why am I talking about Mr. Rogers in particular? Uh, first of all, he's a household name. I feel like everybody feels some type of way about Mr. Rogers, meaning people might actually see the thumbnail for this video and be motivated to check it out, which is always a good thing as a YouTuber. That's what I'm looking for. Um, he's also a really inspiring human being. I feel like we all have something to learn from Mr. Rogers. And finally, he's a great case study for understanding exactly what it is that the objective personality system is looking at when they are trying to decipher someone's type. I say that because you might be surprised at his particular typing in the OP system. It might not be what you would expect. So what would you expect? Like how would you type Mr. Rogers if you were just looking at him, maybe watching a five minute clip of what he does? So my initial theory just looking at this guy is that he is definitely more on the introverted side. He seems a little routine oriented, a little comfort oriented. There's something very cozy about him. So I would probably type him maybe as some kind of ISFJ or some sort of FISI INFP or maybe even an SIFI ISTJ. In contrast to my particular thinking, the theory of the hive mind is that Mr. Rogers is an INFP. That's kind of just the received wisdom, the unquestionable dogma that you might find out there on something like personality database. And it's kind of understandable why you would type this guy as an INFP, particularly if you look at things like this. It's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling you're growing inside. And when you wake up, ready to say, I think I'll make a snappy new day. Unfortunately, there are two big problems with making the kind of type judgment that I just made. So first of all, type is not about a refined product. And what we were just watching was clearly a scripted television product. So this is something that is the final product of dozens, if not hundreds of people who are working to make this thing a well-oiled machine. Um, so for that reason, I also usually overlook things like graduation speeches or TED Talks as a valid source of what someone's type might be. I do think that retroactively, if you know someone's type, you can read their type into a final product, but you shouldn't go the other way around. A related problem is that type is not your character. In a way, your character is also something that can be refined over time. People, certain people have a fixed mindset, certain people have a growth mindset. So the more carefully crafted something is, the less likely you're getting a clear picture of their type. As Mr. Rogers himself says, It seems to me, Charlie, that the things that are center stage are rarely the things that are the most important. It's usually what happens over in the wings. And that's not just something that I'm taking out of context. Charlie Rose was actually asking Mr. Rogers about himself. What are some of the things about you that we might not know? And he says, hey, what you see isn't necessarily what's going on beneath the hood. So if your personality type isn't something carefully crafted, if it's not explicitly related to your character, then what is it? Well, if we go back to the 
original writings by Carl Jung, basically the answer we get is that type is what happens automatically. And then I have a series of bullet points here that have been taken from, I believe, the appendix to psychological types. So to repackage that in a more digestible way, Basically, your personality type is built on these little moments of automatic action and reaction where unthinkingly you are excluding one thing at the expense of another. But the issue is that we can actually actively interfere with these automatic processes, which means it can be easy to hide your type. I think it's particularly difficult to type actors who have publicity training and they know how to like work the crowd and they know how to answer questions from Conan O'Brien. Everyone to some degree is crafting a persona and that persona may hide their demons or it may even hide their savior functions if they are for whatever reason ashamed of those functions. So the real question is how do we determine what is noise and what is a meaningful signal that we can use to build a case for a particular personality type? So the solution that the objective personality system provides is this idea of savior states versus demon states. It's the idea that you can actually interpret someone's type on the basis of changes in their physiological state, changes in their emotional state. These are little areas where that sense of what is automatic actually breaks through the carefully cultivated persona. So with your savior functions or your savior animals, you might start to go on autopilot. You might start to really lean into the conversation. You may forget yourself to a degree, and then you lose that sense of carefully selecting the words. You're starting to betray something of your actual automatic preferences. And the same goes for a demon state. So essentially, if you are someone who is, I don't know, let's say, save your extroverted intuition like myself, and I get you talking about your physical routines, the way that you clean your room. Even if you're afraid to admit that you're an absolute slob, you're probably going to give yourself away in some little way, in some little word choice, in some little slowdown that's happening. And also, I just wanted to say that this whole idea of save your states versus demon states has some textual basis in Jung's thinking. So Jung's earliest work as a psychiatrist was on the notion of psychological complexes, and he basically described complexes as little sub-personalities that could hijack the ego and alter the ego's emotional charge. Some of those complexes are disturbing or painful. They're basically demons, and some of them are actually so good that they inflate us. We feel so empowered by them And these are the saviors, but the issue is, through your saviors, you leave voids, and each savior is connected to a demon, so hopefully that makes some sense. So one problem is that this process of interpreting state changes is not straightforward at all, and I think that that scares away some people who want easy answers, who want a straightforward formula or grid for thinking about type. The issue is that there are always multiple interpretations that are possible, Somebody might be talking about logic, and you can't always tell, is this their default mode of operating, or is this something that they have learned to appreciate? It goes back to that notion of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. These are things you have to keep in, keep in mind as you're making your interpretation. And so given that multiple interpretations are always possible, here are some things that I like to look for. First of all, I look for what's cross-contextual, so am I able to find a similar weirdness, a similar state change in different videos. It's also good to look for cross-checks, so if I think that I'm seeing this savior activation around extroverted intuition, am I able to find moments where there is demon activation around introverted sensing? I also try to make very conservative moves when I'm typing someone, so if I think that I'm seeing really strong play, maybe I will temper that a little bit and say, okay, I'm not seeing play last. And then a final framework that I like to use is this notion of content versus representation. So the content of what someone's saying is basically the overall thesis or the summary, the general point 
of what they're saying, and then the representation as how they get that point across. So someone might be trying to persuade you that they are an INFP, and that's the content of their statement. I am an INFP. This is my identity. I am an INFP. But when you actually carefully examine the full way that they're representing that content, it could be packed to the brim with all of these little logical operators that are that are functioning in an introverted thinking kind of way. So that's something to look for. All right, so let's dive into actually typing Mr. Rogers. We're going to start off with something that I find relatively easy to pick out. Uh, basically, we have Tiger Woods on the left and Tony Robbins on the right. And I like to use these two guys as exemplars of introverted energy for Tiger and extroverted energy for Tony. Basically, if someone seems to have an energetic signature more like Tiger Woods, then I'm inclined to believe that they have sleep and consume and their top three animals. And if they're more like Tony Robbins, then I am inclined to believe that they have play and blast in their top three animals. And this is a part of personality that I think is a little harder to fake. So maybe there's one day out of 100 when Mr. Rogers has energy that is more like Tony Robbins, but every other day he's going to be more on the mopey side. He's going to be more like Tiger Woods. And so here you can see the objective personality type grid. What I've done is I've removed everyone who has both play and blast in their top three animals. Now notice that is actually a more conservative move than saying, oh, Mr. Rogers reminds me of Tiger Woods. So I'm going to pick someone who is sleep consume or consume sleep. I didn't do that. I just wanted to have sleep and consume in the top three. So next I want to examine the question of whether he has OI as a savior or whether he has OE as a savior. So OI, that's going to be introverted sensing, introverted intuition, OE is going to be extroverted sensing, extroverted intuition, and for OI, answers are found in the familiar, the known, the already organized, versus OE, where the answers are going to be found in new, in variety, in taking in more and more and more. And so in examining this coin, I actually found a couple of moments where I saw very similar weirdness. So I'm going to start off with this video where I think he's addressing the Senate or some kind of Senate committee? It's a unique kind of funding in educational television. With this help, now our program has a budget of $6,000. It may sound like quite a difference, but $6,000 pays for less than two minutes of cartoons, two minutes of animated what I sometimes say, bombardment. So the thing about that particular clip that stood out to me was the way that he paused for saying what I like to call bombardment. That was definitely a state change, and for Mr. Rogers in particular, these state changes can be kind of subtle, but notice how different that was from the basic chain of straightforward facts that he was delivering, and then he interjected with a little bit of his own personal flair after hesitating a bit. So the notion of bombardment, there's some weirdness there. And then we have another clip where I think we see similar weirdness. I'm very concerned that our society is much more interested in information than wonder, in noise rather than silence. How do we do that? I mean, in our business, yours and mine, how do we encourage reflection? I trust that this book will do some of that, but oh my, this is a noisy world. And so that clip is very similar to the other clip, even though very clearly these things have been filmed decades apart. So it's interesting because in one of these videos we have the notion of bombardment and in the other he raises the dichotomy of information versus wonder noise versus silence and so again with noise we have this idea of bombardment what we're looking for are moments like 
when he says, how do we do that? The way his voice quickens a bit and he again is betraying something of his true feelings. And then there's a moment where he takes a deeper breath and says, oh my, this is a noisy world. Again, he's shifting his state a little bit and he's betraying something of his automatic preferences. But as I mentioned before, if we think we're seeing one thing, then we better do a cross check to see if we can find its opposite in the opposite state. So if we are seeing this notion of bombardment, information, noise as being more, 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 and that seems to be something of a demon for him, he seems a little bit triggered by that, then we should be able to find in a savior state his introverted observing function, a sense that the answers are found and the familiar and the already known and the organized information. He's there. I just fine. The first Great. thing I have to ask you is this. How many pairs of those tennis shoes have you gone through in 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> I have to know this. I, I couldn't count them, but I do wear the same kind and I buy them each year. I usually buy a pair a year when I go up to Nantucket in the summer. And there's this one store I go into and they say, he's back for his tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I see in this video is an emotional spiking in a positive direction. He's very happy to talk through this routine that he has. He's very happy to wear the same shoes year after year after year. So at this point, I feel pretty comfortable knocking anything off the board that doesn't have introverted intuition or introverted sensing as a savior function. So next, I want to look at the question of observer versus decider. An observer is someone who leads with a sensing or intuitive function, and they tend to feel stuck when it comes to issues of chaos and control. Meanwhile, deciders, they get more stuck when it comes to the question of me versus them, self and tribe. And so here's what I found. When you serve people, uh, Cokes and coffees and what, whatever they might want, you see what what people are like. And I'll never forget the day, and I can't tell you who it was. S somebody said to me, I wanted milk and not sugar. So what we're seeing in that clip is something that happened years ago. He's talking about his early days working in the television industry, and he's a bit stuck on how mean people can be. And then we have a video here. Assigned to a program to go for coffee or Coke or orange juice or whatever the producers and directors wanted. Well, that was a good experience for me because there were those who, who treated me well and there were those who treated me like, how can I say that? There were those who treated me like a servant. So in that second clip, he is stuck processing the same thing that he was processing in the first clip. So here we have another example of cross-contextual support for this idea that maybe we're looking at a decider. In both of these cases, he's stuck with the same story. And then in the second clip, look at how long it took him to process. Um, he was so silent as he was searching for the right words. He didn't know how to describe how it made him feel. He didn't know how to describe um, like what, what words would be appropriate to characterize this experience. He's just talking about moments when people made him feel less than. And to me, he seems a little weirder about this than the observation issues, which we looked at earlier when we were talking about OE versus OI. So that whittles it down a little bit more. Here's what we have now. Next up, I want to think a little bit about his letters. As I mentioned, people seem to see him as an INFP. And in the same way that you can treat something like introverted thinking versus extroverted feeling as a binary coin, or consume versus blast as a binary coin, 
I like to do the same thing with the letter combinations. So although I am a standard ENTP, for example, I have NF above ST because my play is above my sleep, and my play consists of NE and FE firing together, whereas my sleep is my SITI, and that's my last animal. So I treat these like any other binary coin, and I want to know which side of this particular spectrum is Fred Rogers falling on. And when I'm thinking about something like this, I'm wondering what is obvious to him? What is the default mode of operating? And then I compare that with either what is avoided, if this is someone who has a fixed mindset, who wants to avoid their demon functions, their demon animals, their demon letters, or what is the discovery? If this is somebody who is growing in the direction of their demons, then they're not going to have that same weird negativity around their demons, they might have a weird eagerness like, check out this thing that I figured out. And again, we want to keep in mind this idea of the content versus the representation. What is being said versus how is it being said, how is it being presented, how is it being argued. And the thing is, with Mr. Rogers, time and time again, I saw him going into this ST autopilot mode, just like with that Senate committee clip where he was working through things in a very procedural, very clear, reality-based way. He was operating in the realm of sensory facts, and then he was linking together those ideas with logical operators. We do it this way, and we do it this way, but because of this, we had to do this, otherwise this, and yet this. Ergo, he never said ergo, but you know, he was thinking it. And then uh, I included this weird meme um, about how Mr. Rogers was a sniper, which is not true, by the way. I don't know if you guys have seen this floating around, but it's complete bullcrap. Um, but I think it's interesting because I think that people made this because they are observing this strange tension in his character. He presents himself on his TV show and in person as this soft, fluffy, NF type of guy. And he is soft and fluffy, but at the same time, there's some kind of internal discord because he is also someone who is very procedural, very straightforward. He's kind of overwhelming you with this, <laughs> with this abundance of facts. And the reason that I brought up the content versus representation thing is that it seems to me like the discovery is the NF side, and he is presenting that through his default mode of operating, the natural ST way of functioning, and you could very easily imagine him making some other discovery, like he discovers the value of being this insanely intellectual NT philosopher but he would still describe it in that ST way. So you're looking for which one has more solidity, which one is more likely to not change over time. He could talk about being this NT philosopher and say, well, yes, it was 1995 when I met the great philosopher named Charles Blankety Blank. And in his class, I read this particular book. And as a result of that book, I decided, hey, I think I'd like to get into philosophy. <laughs> so basically the point is, which one is invariable? Which one has more solidity? So here's how the type grid looks at this point. And keep in mind, again, I made a conservative move. I'm trying not to be too bold with the eliminations that I'm making. I did not say outright, this is an ST type. Instead, I said his ST animal is above his NF animal, which is why we still have this FISI INFP and this uh, FESI ESFJ. So now the question is, where do we go from here? What kind of questions do we want to examine? We could look at consume versus blast, DE versus DI, S versus N, thinking versus feeling, info versus energy. I feel like I've seen little hints about each of these coins and a really solid personality typing is going to examine each one of these in turn and do all the cross checks. But today, I just want to take a look at the info 
versus energy. So my immediate suspicion is that this is an energy dominant person, which means energy dominance have play and sleep in their top three animals, while info dominance have consume and blast in their top three. And so here are the reasons why I think that Mr. Rogers is probably energy dominant. First of all, my mind jumps back to that interview with Charlie Rose, um, where he was walking through those different dichotomies. He was talking about information versus wonder, and information was the devil in that particular dichotomy. He was talking about noise versus silence. Silence, again, feels very much like this energetic state, and I saw multiple times how he appreciated the value of silence, the value of quiet. So... That's one thing that inclines me in this direction. Secondly, Mr. Rogers is just not me. He's not Jeffrey. He's not auto alchemy. Um, what I mean by that is, as somebody who is info dominant, I'm very concerned about learning a bunch of new stuff and then wanting to teach it to other people. And if somebody is an info dominant who is blast above consume, then they're going to be concerned about teaching a bunch of people and then going to the information and updating that information. And I'm just not really seeing that process in Mr. Rogers. Basically, it seems like his life is more about the energy. Even when he's teaching, he's not teaching some insanely informational thing. He has these very straightforward lessons about how to be a human, how to be kind, how to work through your anger. It also just seems a lot more likely to me that his last animal is blast rather than play. A little girl named him. His original name was Elmer. Yeah, but she didn't like it. No. And uh, I said, well, what would you like him to be called? And she said, Hisher Boop Trunk. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Well, I know some people who are really good ventriloquists. Well, you're not. No, I'm not, Hisher. <laughs> That's not really solid proof of anything, but... I'm trying to look at him holistically now, and it just seems more likely that he has play. And also, I, I want to look at the coin of consume play versus blast sleep. Somebody who has blast and sleep in their top three animals is usually, they have this very deep internal message and they want to hit people over the head with it. They want to blast, they want to lecture, here's the way that it's done. And he just doesn't have that. He has more of an open-ended, like, let's explore things together. Let's take in new information personally, but let's also play and ping off of one another. Okay, so this is what we have left. And at this point, by thinking about Mr. Rogers holistically, by thinking about everything that I've seen, I'm going to say he's more on the TISI side. I don't see him so much as an NT mental puzzler. I see him more as this ST reporter. Um, he lays out the sensory data points in a very procedural way. The organizing that he is doing is very physical as opposed to being based on the convergence to an abstract concept. He's doing the same routine with this show. He's wearing the same outfits. The abstractions that he does play with are very all over the place and varied in the way that any can be. And the way that he talks about extroverted intuition has a little bit of weirdness to it, but it's not so weird that it's his ultimate demon. He talks about it and there's this little glint in his eye. The importance of imagination and these abstract possibilities feel more like a discovery for him. He's not Weird Al, for example, who, for him, extroverted intuition is the air that he breathes. So at this point, the question you're probably asking yourself is, is this really introverted thinking? And to that, all I have to say is, <laughs> okay, but for real, um, if I'm going to say something like that, if I'm going to go so counter to the dogma that Mr. Rogers is an INFP, then I better have some more support than this, right? So one thing that I found as support for introverted thinking is a focus on truth above shallow, superficial feeling. And I think that people sense that we want to be honest with them. You know, I've told children, and many of these people grew up with the neighborhood, 
they were children when we started, and, and now they have children of their own. And many of them know that I would say, this might hurt. You know, if you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you an injection, it might hurt at first, but it won't hurt long. I mean, we're not going to fudge stuff. We're going to tell them the truth, and we're not going to dance around and say how happy things are when they're not. This idea that you have to tell the truth, you have to be honest, and you can't just pretend like things are happy when they're not. So this isn't just like a one-time thing. This is actually a theme in his life. It was really important in his show that he was able to talk about dark, heavy truths. Even if they were emotionally difficult, even if other people didn't think that these topics were necessarily socially acceptable. I mean, who else would make a show for kids where they actually talked about the assassination of JFK? I also found multiple examples of him intellectualizing the emotional realm a little bit instead of actively existing within the feeling. He's thinking about it in a very cerebral way. Those things have deep roots. I guess that, you know, I must be an emotional archaeologist because I keep looking for the roots of, of things, particularly the roots of behavior and why I feel certain ways about certain things. Can you and this is another place to keep in mind this idea of the content versus the representation. Sure, he's talking about emotions, but he's talking about them from a very bird's eye view perspective and the inflection is on the why. I wanted to know why I feel certain ways. Why am I like this? I also found an interesting clip where he was talking about the land of make-believe and he was explaining why the episodes were structured the way that they were and he goes on this really interesting ramble but then he stops himself and says okay I know that that's way overly analytical but that's how I think about it in my head. And I thought that was really interesting because he's dealing with this very fluffy, potentially hippie kind of topic, the land of make-believe, and he was more interested in talking through the logic of it. We start off with this part of the structure, and then we bring in this element, and then this third element comes in that is supposed to reground us. And it was, yeah, it was a very interesting analytical approach that I didn't expect to see. And then I have one final example of some more extroverted feeling. We are. You know, I think everybody longs to be loved and longs to know that he or she is lovable. And consequently, the greatest thing that we can do is to help somebody know that they're loved and capable of loving. So for the introverted thinker, tribe hate is going to be a real demon. They're not going to feel that capable of working the FE, of engaging with community, of connecting, and as a result, the sense of loving and being loved is going to come hard to them. And I think that introverted feeling doms are going to feel this, but the inflection is going to be slightly different. They might feel that they're not being accepted because they're not smart enough, or they're not going to be a productive member of society, their values aren't respected, and they're expected to play this game of participating in the overly rational machine of the world. This is just a note about how our different psyches kind of inflect and emphasize things. So I think that it's more so introverted thinking that is going to think in terms of, am I lovable, am I not lovable, and in a moment of vulnerability here, trying to channel my own Mr. Rogers, this is definitely something that has haunted me throughout the years. Thinking about, like, am I worthy of this? Am I going to find the right community, find the right connections? It's important to keep in mind this idea that we don't preach our demons necessarily. We, we share lessons that we wish that we had heard, and that's why he is so focused on messages as basic as, it's okay to feel anger. It's good to feel sad. He wouldn't be talking about this unless it was something that he needed to hear at a particular point in his life. 
And it's interesting because according to this interpretation anyway, he's speaking from a place of genuine pain and he's decided to take that pain and through this process of alchemy, try to give back to the world. He's converting it into some kind of gold. All right, so what does it all mean? Well, if this guy is lead TI and he's preaching this feeler message, it's also really funny, by the way, that his middle name is McFeely. I didn't even touch on that and kind of wish that I had, but I think that's hilarious. Um, to me, that's why his message is so impactful. Even if you don't have this typological framework, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This man is preaching about the value of make-believe and learning to manage your own emotions. And <laughs> despite preaching those things, th these messages are coming from someone who is as wooden and overly controlled as one of the puppets that he likes to play with. Let me go back to Weird Al for a minute. So if Weird Al came to you and said, hey, I just discovered this thing. It's called creativity. It's awesome. You would be, I don't know, kind of bored, or at least I would be kind of bored. I would be like, isn't this something that's obvious to you? It's also a bit obvious to me. Um, but if he came to me and said, I just figured out how to do my taxes. I've mastered my taxes. I've mastered cleaning my room and developing these very precise sensory processes, then I would be a little more interested in hearing what he had to say. I think in general, that's how we that's how people function. We are curious to hear people preaching their demons, and we don't want to hear people preaching about their saviors. If Mr. Rogers was coming to you saying, let's talk about the importance of getting things accurate, you would be bored to tears, understandably. But this is someone who is preaching the opposite. He's preaching the importance of connection, the importance of emotional support, of kindness, and that is very meaningful. So I think that there's a lesson there for all of us as far as learning to approach the things that are difficult in life, learning to try to achieve mastery over our demons, um, and in doing so, we make the world a more interesting and uh, more <laughs> inhabitable place. Anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you liked the video. I will catch you guys next time.